Hello and welcome. Today I would like to show you one very rare sound card. What is so interesting about it? This combination of the Adlib logo in the left lower corner and the year 1995 is what makes it quite exciting. Everybody knows about the first Adlib music synthesizer card from the year 1987, which became the most used sound standard in games of DOS era. Most of you will also know that Creative borrowed the technology and practically destroyed Adlib later, as it was trying to get their Adlib Gold onto the market. I will not go into details now, since Clint from LGR already covered this topic perfectly, and if you are good in Russian, Artur from Old Robots also made a very good video about it. I will put both links into the description. But in this video I would like to take a look at what happened after the Adlib Gold fiasco to that company. The information is sparse to be honest, but as Adlib went bankrupt, Canadian government acquired the company to save it from creative's claws first. Later, Adlib was sold to the German company Binnenlaster GmbH, which renamed Adlib Incorporated into Adlib Multimedia and relaunched the Adlib Gold Sound Card as well as many other products. Then, in the year 1994, Adlib Multimedia was sold again, now to Softworld Taiwan, and the name Adlib disappeared from the Western market more or less completely. However, Adlib Multimedia continued its existence on Asian market for a while and mainly produced OEM products for computer manufacturers, but retail products could also be found from time to time, however, they were super rare. During my short investigation, I stumbled upon this website, which presents a nice collection of different sound cards, and also multiple Adlib cards can be found among them. There is the original Adlib card, and also some clones from the late 80s, but also the newer models, which were released in the middle of or even in the second half of 90s, obviously from around the time where Adlib was already sold to Softworld Taiwan. Let's take a look, for example, at this ASP64 Wave Pro 4D IDE. Besides the impressive naming, we can see that this card was sold in Germany for 240 Deutsche Mark, taxes not included. The listed features seem to be very impressive. The card is based on the Crystal CS4232 chip, which provides excellent compatibility with the Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 and Windows Sound System. It supports ADPCM sound codec, MPU-401, has no DMA clicking and no hanging note bugs. Funny enough, its FM implementation is quite far from the Yamaha chip which was used on the original Adlib card from 1987. So if the ASB64 has no dedicated Yamaha chip on board, this sound card will not sound like the original. On the other hand, the sound card has outstanding Dream SAM9233 wavetable processor paired with 4MB sound sample ROM and should provide some decent general MIDI sound. Let's take a look at the card itself. The card has no wavetable header, but the general MIDI circuitry is on board. It has an interesting proprietary connector in the middle named Adlib Media Connector, which could be used for modem or other add-on cards. As I already assumed, it has no Yamaha FM chip, that is a pity, but in the second half of 90s OPL3 sound became obsolete and many manufacturers didn't bother. However, it's funny to see an Adlib card without proper OPL sound. Unfortunately, I don't possess this card, and this video is actually about a different one, so why am I showing this to you, you might ask? Well. I just wanted to share with you one interesting observation which I made during my investigation. If you saw my video about Pro Audio Spectrum, you maybe remember that I said that at least until the end of 90s the quality was not a selling point of Creative Labs. They built their business completely around the price. The cards were made as cheaply and sold as expensive as possible, but always slightly cheaper than the opponents. This strategy wiped out all the high-quality products from the market, and companies like Adlib and MediaVision didn't survive. However, looking at the image of this card made me smile for a second. Despite that Adlib was already dead actually, they couldn't betray themselves and continued to make high-quality products. Take a look at the edge connector. Do you see this black-colored surface here? It is a ground plane inside of the PCB. 
Do you remember how I explained the difference between a bad and a good PCB in my video about the Pro Audio Spectrum? Such a black colored edge connectors on the sound cards are almost always a guarantee for a good audio quality due to improved shielding. As I realized that the Adlib was maybe not just a famous name but probably still made some good quality products in the late 90s, I was even more curious about taking a closer look at one of their later products. Adlib produced various products at that time, from the high-end ASB64, which I already mentioned, to less high-end products, most of which remained unknown. And this is where this little card comes into play. A member not aligned from the German DOS Reloaded community kindly borrowed me this card some time ago, so let's take a closer look and see what it offers. First of all, the card's official name is ASP16, and it was made by Adlib Multimedia Incorporated in the year 1995. Interesting is that it still says made in Canada, although at this point in time the company name was obviously already sold to Softworld Taiwan. Just like the previously mentioned ASB64, this sound card was also built around the same Crystal CS4232 chip, and as I already said, it provides outstanding Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 compatibility. But unlike the ASB64, this one has also the original Yamaha YMF262 chip, which provides genuine OPL3 sound. This makes the ASB16 to a really good option for the good old DOS games. Beside the genuine OPL3, this sound card provides also a wavetable header and full MPU 401 compatibility, so it can be used with any wavetable add-on module to enable general MIDI support. On the left there is this white connector, which looks like an IDE header, but it isn't. This is a proprietary Adlib multimedia connector, which can be used for modem and other add-ons. However, during my investigation, I didn't find any traces of such add-on cards, which could be bought back in the days. I'd be curious to know more about it, so please write into the comments if you can supply me with some information. On the back side there is a label Adlib Multimedia, Adlib ASP16 Special Edition. As you can see, there is a quite large ground plane on the back of the PCB. If you saw my video about the Pro Audio Spectrum, you will remember that the bigger the ground planes, the better the shielding and eventually the sound quality. Well, this card has obviously no multi-layer PCB and so no ground plane inside. And there is unfortunately also no ground plane behind of the CS4232 chip, but the ground plane behind of the mixer and amplifier circuits is not bad. So I think that there is a good chance that this sound card's output quality is at least not bad. Furthermore, look how it has almost no electrolytic capacitors, except these two. All the others are tantalum caps. They are more expensive, which is a sign of quality as well. Since tantalum caps are more precise and they don't dry after many years, so they keep a better and more constant quality over the years. However, they tend to explode in flame sometimes, which can be very exciting as well. So let's summarize what we have so far. Probably a good quality sound card with outstanding Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 compatibility, original OPL3 synthesizer, wavetable header and full MPU 401 compatibility. Sounds like a dream card for a DOS gaming machine, right? And I didn't mention the best feature of all yet. This sound card has an 8-bit ISAT edge connector, means that it can be used in any machine down to an XT. This makes it pretty much amazing. Finding a sound card with these features is quite hard. There are some 16-bit cards which would work in an 8-bit ISA slot as well, but an originally manufactured 8-bit card in this quality with full Sound Blaster Pro compatibility and wavetable header is pretty darn rare. The limitation of the 8-bit interface only is that you are obviously limited to RQs 5 and 7, as well as DMAs 1 and 3. All the higher resources are located on the 16-bit ICE extension and so unavailable for this card. But I don't see it as a real problem anyway. Ok, enough theory, let's give it a try. As I got this card I was told that the FM sound seems not to work, but let's do it step by step. First of all, drivers. This sound card is plug and play and has to be activated per software. Unisound works just fine here. Not much to say. As you see, ASB16 was detected, Sound Blaster at the port 220, Windows Sound System at 534. 
By the way, this is an interesting one. Crystal CS4232 officially has support for the Windows sound system, what Unisound obviously knows and activates. However, Windows sound system needs full 16-bit data bus to work properly, and it will not work on this sound card. I made some tests, and the silence confirmed my assumption. So this card must be limited to Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 only. Let's give it a first try in the decent setup utility. Seven. 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 As you hear, digital sound works perfectly in stereo. But we have no FM music indeed. To confirm it, I started some other games, but there I got no FM as well. Ok, let's grab an oscilloscope and make some measurements. As you see, the card in the ISO slot is faced away from me and it is not very handy to poke around with an oscilloscope like that. Therefore, I have a trick which I am using quite often. I am using such an angled razor card. It is a normal point-for-point -point connection razor card, which you could find in thousands of desktop PCs back then, nothing special about it. Then I use a piece of paper for isolation to prevent anything from shorting out, and then I plug the cards I want to test into the razor slot. This way the card is looking upright, and I easily can access all the ICs. Ok, I will let the decent setup utility play some OPL3 music and see if there is some signaling happening on the YMF262 chip. First of all, power. This seems to be good and we are getting 5 volts. Now let's check the chip select signal, which enables the YMF262. It is pin 8 and we should see some rapid triggers there. And as you see, there is nothing. The signal remains at high all the time, and the chip select is low active, so the chip gets never activated. Let's see where the chip select trace is going to. Here it goes from the pin 8, bypasses the resistor R99 and disappears on the other side of the PCB. Here it comes through a via and goes to the Adlib multimedia header. That is strange, because it has to go to the CS4232 somehow. But if you look at the pins nearby, they do actually go into the direction of the CS4232 indeed. On the front, there is indeed a JP1 inscription near the first pin, where the chip select trace is going to. It looks very strange, but the first pair of pins seem to be a jumper and belongs not to the Adlib multimedia connector. Let's give it another try. Again, the FM music in decent setup utility is running. Let's see if we get some activity on that pins. And would you look at that? There is obviously some activity, which looks like the chip select signal we are searching for. Let's add a jumper and see what we get. And we have music! And some activity on the pin 8 of the OPL3 chip as well. That looks right now, but really irritating with a jumper directly near the connector. Maybe the jumper had to be removed if an add-on card had to be installed, who knows. I really don't know, since I didn't find any examples of such an add-on card. By a closer look I found that the second pin of the YMF262 goes to the second pair of pins on the connector. The jumper can be set there as well, but the second pin on the YMF262 is IRQ and is actually optional. I might be wrong, but as far as I know it was not used by any software back in the days, so it shouldn't make any difference if the second jumper is set or not. Anyway, only one jumper was missing and now the sound card seems to be fully functional. It doesn't make a lot of sense to compare the FM sound of this card since it is very same OPL3 chip which was used on the original Sound Blaster Pro 2.0. All I would like to say is that it sounds great. I couldn't hear any noise from the data bus and the sound is quite clean. In Prince of Persia I couldn't hear any DMA clicking and the digital sound was also very clean. As I already have shown in Decent Setup Utility, the stereo sound works also flawlessly. 
seven, seven. Also, ADPCM codec in Duke Nukem 2 works just fine. Off camera, I tested this sound card with a wavetable in general MIDI mode, and that works also absolutely fine. Unfortunately, I didn't capture that, but I think that my wavetables deserve a separate video anyway. All in all, this is one very nice sound card for a DOS gaming PC. I am absolutely convinced that it deserves to have Adlib logo on it, and it is a really nice product. Maybe on the first side it is nothing special, and has the same features as countless other CS4232 based sound cards, like this Crystal Magic S32 for example. However, on the second side, its quality the combination of the 8-bit ISO interface, Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 compatibility and a wavetable header make it quite unique. And last but not least, maybe an interesting point for the collectors among us. It is one of the last products made by Adlib, the company which actually started the gaming sound revolution on a PC after all, and which gifted us with years of childhood FM sound happiness. And I hope you liked this overview. Please don't forget to leave your feedback and I say thank you and goodbye.